What is going on, Scan Fam? We are here with another episode of the Crypto Current. Joined with us today is Zach Marks, the co-founder and CEO of Gia. Zach, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Evan. Uh, pleasure to meet you. Scan Fam, love it. Yeah, of course. Now, Gia is doing some awesome things as far as real-world um, utilization of blockchain technology, um, doing some very you know, grassroots, wholesome things. So, you know, very excited to dig into this episode today. Um, Dennis, go ahead and kick us off, yeah? Awesome. Yeah, uh, Zach, again, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, just kick us off first. Just tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got to where you are today, and uh, then we'll dig into some more meaty questions. For sure. Yeah. So, well, the overview for folks who don't know, Gia, we, we provide blockchain-based financing for small businesses, micro entrepreneurs in emerging markets. Um, how did I end up doing that? Let's just like do the quick story of me. Cause like, why is a random American doing microloans in Kenya yeah. <laughs> and the Philippines? Um, let's see, I, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm originally from Philadelphia, but since college, I really, I mean, I've really always wanted to travel and learn new languages and eat street food around the globe. So when I finished college, my first job was actually teaching English since it was a nice way for me to hop around to new countries. Um, I taught English in schools in Brazil and Ethiopia and India. And it was really, you know, hanging out with the chai wala, the guy selling like chai and samosas outside the school where I taught in India, that I first became really exposed to this challenge of financial access. Um, you know, if you're running a small shop and you need to buy inventory and uh, access higher amounts at lower prices, like that's what you're trying to do as sure. running a business. And you're just trying to do that to feed your family and, and grow your business. And that was be the beginning of my firsthand exposure to the fact that, huh, these you know these guys can't access financing. And that's what, and, and we have this sort of like $5 trillion credit gap in emerging markets. And so um, as I sort of began my professional career after teaching at, as a management consultant at McKinsey, um, I had the chance to start working on financial inclusion projects. And the general challenge, like if, if you say like, why doesn't that guy selling chai and samosas on the roadside in New Delhi have access to bank financing. Banks will basically say like two main reasons. Um, one is that there's no data to underwrite them, right? It's not like he has a credit score. He doesn't have a lot of formal financial data. So you're not, you're not really sure how many samosas this guy is selling. Right, okay. right. Um, the second thing is he, it's, it might not be, the bank probably just sees it as not really worth their while. Like they could do a million dollar financing of like a big corporate uh, business in, in Delhi, or they could give this guy like a hundred dollars of working capital. It just like probably costs them more to serve him than, than it is worth for, for them. So that's sort of like, is the overview of the, of the challenge. And when I started working on microfinance uh, programs, that was what I think is like the first real formal attempt to solve this problem. And so people might be familiar with the Grameen Bank or have heard of Muhammad Yunus who won the Nobel prize for this concept, but mm -hmm. the basic idea the first way that people tried to solve this problem was um, we'll sort of leverage existing community finance groups so for millennia the way people have been saving and borrowing is in small groups together it's just like you know a, a little village savings and yeah. uh, and lending cooperative and so i worked with a bunch of groups like that um I, and initially i was my, my, my first exposure to this i was doing agriculture microfinance in south sudan shortly after they got independence hmm. um and worked on these sorts of programs in, in a few other countries and what i got to see there is hey you know there's something really powerful about this idea of community where people all know each other and trust each other and they have this ownership stake um but that initial traditional microfinance model it's very hard for it to scale like for every new person you want to sign up you need to basically have a loan officer like a human go and sign them up and onboard them and and the trust kind of breaks down in these groups once it gets to be a certain size and so in search of scale i'd say that my, the next jump in my career was to work in the second wave of microfinance i think which is sort of fintech lending programs and and i was one of the early employees um at a company called tala which was really the first company to do mobile lending so the idea is like pretty it's simple but revolutionary the idea that if there's all these people in the world without credit scores, well, they have phones and your phone has all this data about you. So we had this mobile app, which would use people's phone data to underwrite them for very small loans. And that's where my, uh, my co-founders and I all met. We all were, we all worked there and, and saw that company get, get really go from like a couple thousand borrowers to several million borrowers around cool. Africa, Asia, cool. and Latin America. And, um, 
some, you know, I think basically it's applying some of the lessons we learned there, um, both in from traditional microfinance, which is community owned to fintech lending that's led us to, to start GIA. And, and basically the, the biggest piece of user feedback that always sort of motivated me was a lot of our borrowers in Kenya, um, they would be in these community finance groups um, called SACOs, a savings and credit cooperative. And we'd hear folks say, hey, with my SACO, after I repay my loan, I put my money in and then I get shares. So I'm an owner and I've been taking your fintech mobile loans for a year now. I, I, I want some piece of this ownership pie. Like, can I have shares? And it's very difficult for a US based fintech company to uh, in an in instant sort of disperse fractional shares around the globe and make those shares liquid. Mm -hmm. And one of the really powerful things about the blockchain is if you represent ownership on chain with a token, um, you can actually distribute ownership in this really efficient and I think more fair and inclusive and exciting way. And so that sort of was the was the genesis of of Geo was this idea that, huh, what if we could provide this rewarding um, microfinance that sort of ties into how people are used to doing it for generations, but with the scale of fintech lending. Um, and, uh, and so we, we started GIA and, and just so, so folks know why it's called GIA, um, then I'll, I'll wrap up my, my long soliloquy here, um, in, um, it's sort of like an homage to our global teams and multilingual nature in, uh, yeah. in Chinese, uh, Jia means home or family. And we think that's the sort of central financial unit we're building upon in Hindi, Jia means heart and we're providing banking with a heart. And finally, in Swahili, um, which is what folks speak in Kenya, which is our first market, um, Njia means road or path. And we think of mm -hmm. this as the, the path to financial independence. So that's how we got here. Nice. That's a very cool Genesis story. I'm, I'm glad you touched on where the name came from, as um, that was going to be one of my questions. But, uh, you know, it's a very cool story. I would love for you to elaborate a bit on the blockchain aspect. How do you leverage blockchain in this like micro lending platform, essentially? Yeah, there are two main applications of blockchain technology we're using for now. And, and I, I really think of blockchain as just, it's just another, it's a technology, it's a means to an end for us. The end is providing a financial product that gives, uh, you know, it, it fairly finances small businesses and also provides sustainable returns to investors. Um, it's just, you know, it's not like, um, it's interesting because a lot of businesses sort of style themselves as like, Block, such and such for blockchain, but it's not like when people like when like Uber launched, it's not like they were like Uber built on Skip, like right, <laughs> using right, like right. using yeah. Scala or whatever. Like who really cares what the technology is? Um, that said, it, it is it is powerful stuff, and it's worth just talking about it. The two main applications we have right now are, are one, um, the it, it is how we're going to you know use the token, and the the token rewards model is based on. You know, token owners have claims to a flow of on on chain revenues, um, but that token is actually not live yet. And so the the right now the borrowers are actually receiving GIA points, and our investors sort of receive GIA token warrants. So the, the so so that's sort of like in beta mode, I'd say. Sure. What is what is live now is uh, using blockchain as a capital aggregation strategy, right? So we have you know previously to invest in emerging markets small business opportunities. Uh, so this is usually like sort of like the realm of uh, hedge funds or institutional private credit funds, just large institutional investors, you know, usually maybe like someone based in like New York or London, even if the loans are happening in Nairobi or right. Manila, um, but not really available to normal investors. And so we've launched um, an on-chain pool. Um, it's actually, it's right now sort of just a, a private link but by the time this podcast goes live it'll be live on a hmm. protocol called the huma protocol h-u-m-a um and what they're really interested in is building sort of real world income backed uh DeFi. and the idea is how can we bring real world assets on chain um and so investors can deploy some capital to blow their usdc and we take that and use that to unlock liquidity for these small businesses um in, in in a lot of ways, this is a very like burgeoning, like early early field. You know, we're we're only now just tokenizing U.S. real estate and um, sort of like on chain receivables. And I think what's going to happen is you're going to start to see more and more applications of 
tokenizing real world assets that maybe say a small business in Nairobi has, maybe they have an invoice and we can bring that on chain to unlock mm -hmm. liquidity. Can you walk us through the process of like applying for a loan or like, yeah. Yeah. and how long does it typically take for borrowers to receive funds? Can you talk a little bit about that? I'm just super interested in this whole ecosystem as well. Yeah. So for today, it's still a bit of a permissioned experience. It's not like going to like a DeFi lending protocol and just connecting your wallet and you're sort of, you know, seam seamlessly right. uh, accessing capital. What's happening is we basically partner with uh, local trusted organizations that have a network of small businesses who have a need for financing in emerging markets. And really sort of like two reasons for that. One, emerging markets are pretty low trust environments, so people aren't just going to take a loan from anyone who shows up. Mm -hmm. And two, one of the challenges I mentioned earlier is having data to underwrite. It's really hard to assess borrower's creditworthiness, but there are all these networks out there that have some access to some proprietary data that would be good for underwriting. And so what I mean by these networks is wholesale, like often it could be wholesalers. So folks who, um, you know, sell goods or distribute them to uh, local merchants. Uh, an example of the first partnership we did in Kenya is with a company called Ilara Health. They basically have a network of 2000 medical clinics, like really small roadside clinics uh, around the country. And these clinics all need access to financing, right? Because they maybe buy their medicines on Monday, but the patients don't come in until Friday and mm -hmm. don't pay them for a week or something. Um, and Ilara, they just want to provide great medical service. They want to provide devices and medicines and help clinics run their business. They don't want to necessarily be a lender. So we step in and we use Ilara's proprietary data, and then we provide an inventory financing product to let these clinics buy medicines on, on credit. So that's an example, right? And the user flow there, if you're a clinic, is when you're top when you're when you're making your weekly order of medicines, you know, like I've got a thousand dollars worth of antibiotics and anti-malarials or something like that. Uh, you could obviously just pay in cash, which is how people used to do it in the past. But now you could actually finance that with Gia. And um, what's exciting about what happens there is for now the crypto is abstracted, right? They just think that, and our whole philosophy is really meeting people where they are. And we haven't heard the medical clinics say, "Hey, I want some." Some crypto thing they have said they want their inventory financed sure. and so what happens in the back end then is money is off ramped from the pool goes to finance the clinic and when they repay it's re on ramped um so that's sort of just, i guess uh, an example of how it works yeah you know i think that just goes back to what you said earlier about uber you know it's not um you have all these companies in blockchain and you know they're utilizing blockchain and tokens as a buzzword um you know but you guys are really taking the approach of it's about the product um, and the blockchain is the infrastructure that allows us to deliver that product um, in an efficient way, you know, and in a way that these communities need. And it's actually, you know, more efficient than the legacy version. So, you know, I think that's very cool. Um, it's very neat that you guys have seen and are utilizing that approach. In terms of partnerships, I know you mentioned you guys partner with like the local hospitals um, that are roadside. Yeah. What does that strategy look like? Uh, as you're going into these under like served communities, like what is the strategy going into these places and how do you guys plan to expand? Well, the reality is there's a ton of these sorts of companies. Just, um, commerce is quite disaggregated, um, I'd say, or you know, disp dispersed in in um, emerging markets. I mean, in Kenya alone, Kenya is only a country of like some 50, 60 million folks, but there's probably uh, even just there, like something like 6 million um, maybe even estimated higher, like seven or eight million MSMEs and just a micro, small, medium enterprise is the mm -hmm. acronym. Um, and it's um, and, and the best way I think to serve them is to go through these sorts of networks. Uh, so there are, you know, many of them that we've already partnered with. I think we probably have uh, ten of these partners live, and another twenty that we're working on getting live. And there's just a real strong demand. Um, and this, you know, this, it's, it's not actually uh, all that different from what happens in the U.S. I mean, for example, there's there are payment gateways that everyone knows, you know, when you swipe at a coffee shop, you like check out on Square or something like that. Right. Well, it's natural that Square provides a Square Capital product. So the similar stuff in Kenya, you know, we've partnered with this company called Sasa Pay, which is sort of a mobile payment gateway. It lets people take, um, you know, mobile money payments for something as small as like you're just buying like some bananas on the roadside. Hmm. Um, and then we're able to use those transactions to, to plug in and provide a merchant working capital um, product. So it starts with those partners, but what we've already actually seen is, I think it's, it's really not a surprise, but once, once someone finds a solution that works for them, that they can trust, the word of mouth 
actually is sort of the best channel. So an example of one of the first borrowers we got from the Sasa Pay partnership is a guy named Francis who sells spices in a market in Nairobi. Um, obvious use case for why you need financing. He, like even literally when I was there meeting him, uh, a guy from a local restaurant came up to try to buy some sesame seeds for his restaurant and Francis was out. And why was he out? It's like, well, he has to buy his sesame seeds basically every other day because he can only, you can sort of buy a 25 kg shipment or like a 100 kg shipment. And the 100 kg just costs a lot more. So he has to buy them like more regularly. And of course that means higher unit prices and so lower margins and he runs out of inventory sometimes. Natural case for financing. So we've been serving Francis with, uh, with, with this like merchant working capital product. And he's already started to refer all these folks from mm. his, his market. Cause if you go to, if you go to the market where he is, there's like hundreds of, of, of small shops. Um, and so if Francis finds something that works for him, that community is going to begin to, to build in. And I think there is really something about playing off the already existing offline community networks and just bringing them online and bringing them on chain and not really trying to do something like too revolutionary, but just building on what already exists. In for the sure. World. It's a little bit off topic, but I'm curious, you know, like in your saga in the GIA company, how much um, of a trouble has the language barrier been? You know, I assume that, you know, you're dealing in all of these different countries. There's got to be quite a few languages being thrown around. Yeah. Well, our team is, we, I mean, we really have a global team. So actually, I mean, most of our, I mean, I happen to be talking to you from California right now, but most of the team is in Kenya and the Philippines. Okay. Um, and so that's where, and, and folks speak Swahili and Tagalog. Sure. Um, I speak enough to just like sound sound funny, but <laughs> yeah. we don't we don't rely on me personally doing yeah. all the user research in Swahili. Thankfully, cool. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges? I know like building this infrastructure and supporting these small businesses is not an easy task. Can you maybe talk about some and, and maybe how you overcame others uh, as well? So just just a little bit of background there. Yeah. Um, let's see a handful of challenges. I mean, right now, some of the, the more fun, like product challenges that we're working through that I feel like anyone who's any like scan fam members who are like building in this space is how do you, it's just a, delivering a great user experience. I mean, everyone talks about like in the, in the U S and like developed markets where people are very used to FinTech apps and are already like software engineers, very capable of figuring something out we talk about how how difficult the crypto wallet experience can be mm -hmm. and so for us it's even like more more challenging is how do we deliver a really seamless user experience for folks who might have like slightly lower digital literacy might not be as certainly aren't like comfortable like navigating something like you know holding a seed phrase let alone sometimes just accessing more basic fintech apps i, I don't mean to say that actually in a like as if our borrowers are not sophisticated. I think in the West, I think we're maybe quick to maybe sort of assume or judge that people like, oh, they need financial education. They need to help managing their finances. And I think that's actually not really the case from what I've seen in general, when people are already dealing in situations of scarcity, where like they really need to plan very thoughtfully where every shilling goes, I actually think people are, they're much better at managing their budgets than like than we are like mm -hmm. tech, you know tech workers in the wex making six figure salaries it's much easier for us to have like who knows where we spent that much money at you know uh, on an e-commerce subscription or whatever last month um so uh but so so some of the challenges that we're working through right now though are working through how can we represent this sort of um on-chain token ownership partly before the token has launched so what we've begun with is uh, the concept of GIA points, we might you know, play around with the language and call them GIA coins or something like that to begin to introduce this concept of that this thing is a token. Right. And it's really hard to say, just like to call it like ownership is kind of like a nebulous idea. So we make this very real for them by just tying the points to credit rewards. So today what happens is as you repay, for example, or as you refer a new borrower who repays and grows the community, you accrue GIA points. And you can use them initially to do things like get a discount on your interest rate or to get a higher loan amount or more flexible payment terms. But it's also liquid. It's not just like, you know, a frequent flyer mile is like you can use it for like buying a United plane ticket, yeah. but you can't like liquidate it and trade it, you know. Um, and so what, we're, what we want to do from the beginning is see, you know, if people have the option to say get 500 shillings off of their 
uh, like G alone, or just cash it out for 250 shillings, or cash it out for like two dollars and fifty cents in USDC to begin their sort of building their on-chain history. What do they want to do? And so that's actually what we're experimenting with right now, which is pretty fun. Um, so that's a that's sort of a fun challenge. Yeah, how do you measure the impact of Gia's loans on small business owners and, and their communities? Like, do you guys have like a like a, an overview or like a, a, I'd love to kind of hear a bit more about that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it, you know measuring the impact of any like social program certainly is really is is hard. I mean, you need like longitudinal studies and you need like a significant sample size. And even only now are people beginning to do the, that kind of work on microfinance, which has been around for decades. Um, I think the, for us, the, the things we really want to make sure of are just some, just some basic benchmarks is like, well, what was this business's revenue and profit margin before they met GIA? And what is it, you know, after several months with us? And we should be, you should be able to see the, you know, the change of, okay, well, like I mentioned, Francis was buying 25 kgs at whatever it was, like 50 cents a, a, a kg. And now is he able to buy a hundred at 20 cents a kg, he should have, he both, both should have more revenue because he has more stock that should be moving and he should mm -hmm. have higher margins. And with those margins, what's that happening? Is he, I mean, if he would be investing in his family, like buying some real estate, or he could just be investing in growing his business. And already we have begun seeing that. Some of our uh, borrowers have opened second locations or expanded their stalls. A lot of times it's just adding several new product lines. You know, like the typical thing you see in a lot of markets is, Maybe someone just sells fruits, okay, adding vegetables. Or in like Francis's case, it's one thing to just sell the ex like, you know, plain spices, like sell, sell cumin seeds and sesame seeds, mm -hmm. but then to actually have some value addition because he's invested in a spice mill. So now he can process that into like a biryani masala mix and you can mm -hmm. obviously charge a higher, you know, a higher, a higher, um, price for that since he's, he's added some value. So that's sort of, I mean, this is like kind of basic stuff, but that is like, the, that's like what ends up being a game changer. Very cool. Um, I'm curious, what's like the uh, typical loan amount that you guys are seeing? The average is around $500. So, um, and that, you know, it, it can go slightly higher. We've had, I think our biggest loan right now might be uh, up to 5,000. Um, and that one's a bit more secured. It's sort of like an invoice finance product, which sure. is, which we're doing with several partners. Um, and the way that you know the reason why that's it's sort of like receivables factoring is sort of a is is a, is a term people are familiar with. Um, but the idea is, say I have an invoice out with like a um, the, we're working with this uh, beverage distributor in Kenya, which sells um, it's, it's called Kenya Originals. If you guys want to check it out, there like they have they have these really cool like flavors of like local like liquor hmm. cocktail kind of things. Anyway. Yeah. So they're selling to supermarkets. They have invoices out. The supermarkets are like good for it. They're big established working businesses. Right. But, you know, Kenny Original just wants to unlock some liquidity to plug it back into their business and not have to wait the 60 days uh, until the supermarket pays them. For sure. So that's where some of the larger sizes come from. Um, and we're, you know, we're certainly looking at expanding that, increasing that limit as well. That's awesome. And and how do you how does GIA ensure that both lenders and borrowers are like rewarded for the value that they contribute into the system? So I know you mentioned there's points, but is, yeah. is maybe in the long term vision, like how do you see that um, reward yeah, the, really scaling? In the long term vision, I think what feels really important, just from a, like the, the high level perspective, before we get into like the details of the math and everything, is how do we align the interests of lenders and borrowers? Because if you go back to that concept of uh, a SACO of a savings and credit cooperative, or just like any sort of small, like even like a, a credit union. I mean, that's how these work in the U.S. We have credit unions. The idea is everyone is sort of has their interests aligned. They're all in the same boat. Like the lender, you know, lenders want the borrowers to repay, and the borrowers want to repay because they're also owners of that institution, and so they want it to grow. Um, and um, so we, the idea is like, how do we take that at scale? And one great way to do that is just having like everyone own a token, own some share of mm. the enterprise. Um, now that what, you know, the, there is some devil in the details then when it comes down to, well, how, how are you compensating different folks or how much, like how much, how many token rewards does a borrower get for referring a borrower versus how many token rewards does an LP get for keeping their money locked up in the pool? Um, a lot of that actually is, I mean, that's what that kind of, experimenting we're doing right now to ensure there's 
a sustainable financial model. Um, so right now it's publicly available. As we, you know, we have a white paper which starts to explain some of the distribution uh, mechanism, mechanisms. Um, but that's the kind of thing that definitely has to be refined several times before a token launch because For it's sure. obviously a way that projects can just sort of get killed. Yeah. Overnight. yeah. And I mean, that's not really something you can redo. I mean, you can, but yeah. it gets messy. Um, I'm curious, yeah, really. um, maybe you can share some of the like launch plans with us, like how you guys intend to do that. Yeah. Um, so the, as I mentioned, sort of we're already live lending in Kenya and the Philippines. The on-chain launch that should have happened already by the time this thing goes live is that uh, the Huma pool is live. Initially, we're only taking KYC accredited investors just to ensure everything is very compliant from mm -hmm. from day one, um, which I there's probably like some DeFi DGENs. I'm not sure who is exactly in the scan fam, but there's some people probably who will not like that idea that they have For to sure. KYC. Yeah, we got to mix yeah, everyone. You so. know. We're, and and to those folks, I'm sorry that we're not serving that need. But for now, if you're an accredited investor, you can connect your wallet. Um, and um, the idea is that you'll get both a USDC return on that deployment, but you'll also get token rewards um, in the form of a of a warrant, uh, which is how our it's like that's how that's even how our Geoco equity investors have sort of have their claims on um, on the on the future token at launch. Um, I think there's some like just some fun things with the launch that I mentioned. I mean, I think one of the really cool things that I've seen in the in the crypto community is it's just like it's fun. Like NFTs are fun. I mean, I think they're kind of silly. Like I, I personally yeah. didn't get into like collecting a ton of them, but the, it's I think the idea of um, linking sort of creator rewards to some collectible is really cool. So that's like secondary sales go back to the artist. And so one thing we're doing at launch is. Um, just, just to test this out, like launching a small NFT collection where we have a digital artist, um, we're just like working on the details, so I shouldn't like say a name yet, but just sort of is making cool digital representations of a bunch of our borrowers, like mm. Francis the Spice Vendor gets a <laughs> collectible, <laughs> nice. and nice. you know Armand the Baker in Manila gets a collectible. Mm. And the idea is to, you know, we, we're, we'll, we'll do a, a free mint at launch, um, which you know is a fun thing for the community. But on top of that, if people want, they can like add a top up amount which can go towards the small business directly. And just, I think that's one of the cool things I've seen is just the sh is shrinking the world, making it so that like today, if, if you wanted to invest in Francis, like the way your money could actually get there before Gia came along, like the way your money could get there is probably you could keep some money, I don't know, like in a, in, in some savings account, which maybe like a, a bank says some portion of it, like going into a hedge fund, some of which is in an institutional credit fund, somehow is like trickling down to a microfinance institution and getting to Francis, but it's very mm -hmm. far from like Evan in California to Francis in Nairobi. Right. Whereas right now, imagine if you like own an NFT and are sort of like connected to Francis in this way and are actually directly financing him through a liquidity pool. It's just sort of making the world a bit smaller. Yeah. I love that. And, and that kind of ties it right back to the, the my last question. Just like, how do you see Gia evolving over the next five to 10 years? And what are some like key milestones you hope to achieve in that time? Yeah. So one thing for sure is just becoming like more of a partner in small businesses lives. Uh, one thing that I've heard so much working in this space is that people don't just want, they don't just want capital. They don't just want like, Hey, it's not just give us money. It's also like give us resources to help us grow. That could be everything from just like connections to other suppliers who are doing things at lower prices, but often it's like resources and skills. I mean, I heard this over the pandemic so much about people who wanted to begin selling online or setting up an online shop, but they didn't have anyone in their community who could help with digital marketing. Um, and so we're, what we're working on is setting up a sort of a global service provider network of small businesses so people can exchange information and exchange resources. So the idea is unlocking not just global capital, but global resources to small businesses. Um, and so that's sort of a, a big piece, as well as sort of expanding the list of financial products. So once, I think one of what, what, what we have on the roadmap is once we establish trust with these small businesses by providing them financing, the idea is, well, how else can we help with their financial life? And a thing that, I mean, crypto folks always talk about this, but um, in a lot of markets where the currency is unstable or is devaluing, there's a strong demand to hold your money in other forms of currency, like most common, just like a US dollar stable yeah. coin. But if we're already um, giving people access to financing, it's naturally might help them 
save as well. Maybe they, we help them save in a USDC. And now we've begun to on-ramp them onto this world of Web3 by saying, hey, they have a GIA token, they have some USDC with us, what's next? Maybe we teach them how to participate in this sort of broader uh, crypto economy, which I think can be really exciting. Yeah, and that is outstanding. You know, I think it's amazing to see all the different ways you guys are, you know, serving these underserved communities, um, you know, and it's a huge geographical scale, um, you know, even from a business scale, you know, I'm sure you guys have a potential of like lots of micro volume, right? Like dealing with those micro um, and small businesses. I mean, I think it's amazing, you know, all the ways that you guys really are looking to help these businesses and the ways that you have already started as well. Um, do you have anything else you want to say before we wrap this up, Zach? Um, I'd say one thing I'd love to do is just like sort of keeping is engaging with the community. I don't really know exactly how people with ScamFam usually are engaging, but we have at the very least would love um, I mean, like, follow us on Twitter. I'm at yeah, zmarks25 yeah. and Gia is at Gia underscore DeFi. Um, go check out our our white paper. We're trying to launch. We're going to launch like a fun little educational like quiz thing where like people can just like earn some NFT or like mm. like you know uh, for just like reading the white paper and like understanding what we're doing. Um, reach out if you're interested in contributing to the project. We're going to start. We're going to spin up our our Discord and try to find more ways to have community bounties and, and help folks and, and let folks get engaged you can always reach out to me i'm zach at gia.xyz and uh i'd love to hear from you awesome yeah we'll make sure to leave all of those links in the description um as well as at the end of this episode there will be a little um, infographic with some of that contact information um zach thank you so much again for joining us i think awesome business um gia you know look forward to seeing what you guys do in the future um, very cool seeing blockchain really get utilized for the technology itself, not just for the hype or the buzzwords. Um, and yeah, this has been the CoinScan team coming at you guys with the crypto current. Uh, make sure you guys look at the description, comment, like, subscribe, and we will see you next week. <laughs>